Uh, this is a good time for under servants to go to the bank. Uh, we are continuing then uh, with our series in Matthew. Uh, we are still on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Uh, let me just read it again to uh, remind us. Uh, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. And so we have seen uh, so far in the Sermon on the Mount from verse 13 to 14 that there are only two possible options. There is a narrow gate uh, that goes to heaven and there is a broad road that says heaven but goes to hell. Uh, the narrow gate is hard to find and hard to go through because it demands denial of self. Denial of self-righteousness. It demands a recognition of sin. It demands full repentance submission to Christ, commitment to obey him and follow him no matter what the cost. And it's hard to find that truth and hearing it. It's hard to act upon it because of the love of self and the love of sin, which is natural for the sinner. The true way to heaven is hard to find. It is away from the crowd. It is narrow. You come naked. You come alone. You come with a repented heart. And you strive to enter. And at the same time, most religious people are on the broad road. There are plenty of false prophets who are enabling them, preparing them on. And they are discussed in verse 15 to 20 of Matthew 7. The false prophets, the false religious leaders, the false uh, representatives of Christ, false agents of God, if you will. But really they are the agents of Satan. They are ministers of Satan, disguised as angels of light, but they're leading people on a road that says heaven, but ends up in hell. And so we saw that in verse 15 of Matthew 7. You see, the, the tragedy here in our text, now, it's a tragedy for anybody to go to hell. Of course. It's a tragedy for uh, Hindus, for, for uh, Buddhists, for Muslims. It's a tragedy for atheists. It's a tragedy for those Jews who reject the Messiah to go to hell. It's a tragedy for anybody to go to hell. But it is the tragedy of all tragedies. It's that of repeated Judas tragedy. Where you hung around... Jesus, but end up belonging to Satan. That's the biggest tragedy. That's the real tragedy. When you hear the gospel week in, week out, when you spend time with believers week in, week out, when you have the word at your fingertips, but yet you belong to Satan. 
You see, when the Lord said these words, he was not speaking to religious people. He was speaking to people who were very religious. Very religious. They were obsessed with religion. In fact, they couldn't divorce their social life, their civil life, their economic life, their family life, their national life from their religion. Everything they did was incorporated in religion. So we can't say these people did not know God. Everything they did, their whole life, was religion. They are the most religious people. But they have no relationship to God and no relationship to Christ. They are religious but lost. They are on the wrong road. Paul said they have a form of godliness without the reality of it. And so they are self-deceived. Now what is shocking about this text is bound up in the word many. Many. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many, verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. So they are the same many who are back in verse 13. The gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. And so many go into the way of destruction. Many walk the way of destruction and many show up at the end of the way of destruction. And so what do these many say to the Lord at the end? We didn't believe in you. We rejected you. No. That's not what they say. They say, Lord, Lord, we did all of this in your name. We did this, we did that in your name. And only to hear, I never knew you. And this is the most terrifying of all possibilities. That you are at the close you at the end and you're lost and that's many now few on the other hand find the narrow way so we can conclude just by the lord's use of these words here that most people who have some attachment to christianity are indeed deceived since many will claim Christ but be unknown to God and few will actually find the narrow way many are like the virgins in Matthew 25 waiting for the bridegroom to come and when he came they weren't prepared they were not ready they didn't have oil in their lamps they thought they were safe they were part of the wedding party. They were invited. They were selected to be there. And so judgment day came for them. And it was a terrifying surprise because they were not ready. So I just want to, for the next few moments, is look at some reasons to why many will hear those words. And we are talking about those who are so near, but yet so far. And let me just cover a few points to why many will hear those words. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Paul says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Now, first uh, Corinthians 11, he says, let a man examine himself and then let him eat and drink. 
And so the problem is we don't think about self-examination like that. We tend to be so grace-oriented. We tend to be told that God loves you so much and the gospel is so free and, and grace is abound and, 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 and that's it. And that will have to do. Just reach out and everything is fine. And once we've done that, we have the false sense of insurance. Why would we become introspective? Why would we be doing a self-examination? Why would we do that? You know, some might say, well, if, if I do that, it will cause offense to God. It would undermine His grace. So I don't need to self-examine myself. And so we don't think of self-examination in that way. And so because we fail to do a self-examination, we end up resting in self or false assurances. False sense of assurance. And what I mean by that is drawing our assurance that you are that you are a Christian, maybe because you prayed a prayer or because you felt emotional when somebody talked to you about Christ or you saw a film about Jesus and you felt emotional about the way he was treated or somebody told you uh, as that you were in. Or, or somebody said, you know, if you just say these words or repeat after me and, and that's it, you're in. You don't have to worry about anything else. You are a believer. And somebody might even say to you, if you pray that prayer, you are saved. Don't doubt it. So you've been told that's that simple. And you've had some well-intentioned person satisfy you as a true believer. Now, look, yes, salvation requires that you believe the gospel. It does require that you believe the true God, the true Christ, his death, his resurrection. It does require that, yes. But salvation is not based on a formula. It's not based on a simple prayer and the seat you in. It's not even based on a creed, if you will. It's not even based on an accurate theology. You can say all the right things and still be lost forever. And so people are, are, are pulled into this false sense of safety by a failure of self-examination. A failure of self-examination. You see, the Lord gave us an ordinance um, in the church, and that is his table, the Lord's Supper. And the Apostle Paul tells us when we come together as a church, and we come to the table, we are to examine ourselves. It is not just a memorial. It is not just a, a, a remembrance. It is not just a remembering the death of Christ, the body and the blood of Christ. Yes, it is that. But it is also looking inward to our own hearts and doing an honest evaluation of our condition. Not to do that is to eat and drink in an unworthy way. And that brings down divine judgment. So, what are you looking for then when you do a self-examination? When you are examining yourself, what are you looking for? You are looking for these things. What are my affections? What are my affections? What, what are my loves? What are my desires? What are my motives? If they are godly, if your affections, your desires, your motives are godly, if they are all godly, then that's the work of the Holy Spirit. If they are worldly and sinful, if they're lustful, no matter what you claim, no matter what anybody thinks of you, 
If the self-examination reveals a heart that desires sin, desires the, uh, loves the world, is motivated by personal desire and lust, no matter what your attachment to Christianity is, no matter what prayer you've prayed, you haven't been changed by the living God. Now, please don't get me wrong. I am not talking about struggles. I'm not talking about temptation, as Duncan rightly pointed out this morning. In fact, I would say, if there is no struggles, if there is no temptation, if there is no war within you, that actually could also be an indication that you have not been changed by the power of the living God. But that's not what I'm talking about. It is Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So just using this as an example, Paul here uses the example of coveting. And that is deeply desiring something or someone that belongs to another person. And so God's law commanded Israel, you shall not covet in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21. And so Paul learned what coveting was in a formal sense from the law. The law told him, do not covet. And because of that, Paul knew what the law says, and he knew what coveting was. Then he writes in the following verses, as he discovered the sin of covetousness in himself. And so, now how else would he have known that covetousness was in him unless he did a self-examination? And so, this is what I'm talking about this morning, that we have to have a self-examination where we face the truth head on. You see, the other reason that people have a false assurance is simply religious activities. Maybe you go to church, maybe you go to a Bible study, or maybe you even have conversations about the things of Scripture. Maybe you adhere to certain ethical standards that is associated with Christian religion. And that's very common. Because I'm doing these things, I am saved. And again, that also could be a false assurance. And of course, we also have the many who assume that their good deeds outweigh their bad ones. You know, I hear this a lot. You know, so basically people think, well, I'm not as bad as some people. You can always find people who are worse off than you. And so they think, because I'm not as bad as others, I'm all right. And some people think, well, we'll balance off our bad with our good. And they say, you know, we're not doing bad things. We're doing less bad and more good. And because of that, I'm okay. And then finally, there are those who are indifferent to the scriptures. Indifferent to the word of God. They call themselves believers and yet they could not care less what the scriptures have to say. You tell them, you know, don't do this or don't do that because scripture commands that we do this and do that instead. And they say, I don't care what the Bible has to say. They say it feels good to me. And because it feels good, it must be all right. And so they don't really care about reading the scripture. They, they're not particularly interested in hearing the scripture. They're not interested in learning the word of God. They don't have an appetite for divine truth. And because there, there is an indifference to Scripture, there is ignorance about Scripture. And that results to disobedience. 
You know, they say I'm a Christian, but I don't have to live my life according to a book. I believe God speaks to me through, through love and through energy. And so they're indifferent to Scripture. It's not their soul food. They don't delight in His truth. They, they don't have a desire to dig into His truth so that their lives can be enriched and be uh, profoundly changed. They don't know what it says. They really don't care what it says. In fact, they're offended by what it says. And they're those who have a false assurance because of what they say. And so this is what Jesus is speaking about here. Those who have a false insurance because of their own words. Now you see the thrust of the Lord's message here in our text is dealing with those who don't mean what they say. Again, I'll read our text, Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, verse 22, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. When you say what you don't mean, they're the sayers, but not the doers. Their claims are deceitful. They say the right things, they don't leave the right things. And so Jesus is explicit here about their, their claims. He says in verse 21, they say to me. He says it again in verse 22. Men will say to me on that day. And so all their religious efforts are directed at him. But their final destiny will not be based on what they say. What they say now or what they say on that day. Their final destiny will not be based on what they say. As good as it sounds. And then in the second paragraph, as we will see the section next time, it is the ones who have only an intellectual knowledge, an intellectual knowledge. Verse 26, everyone that hears these things. So, verse 21 to 23, you have the people who say and don't do and then verse 24 to 27 the people who hear and don't do and that's the issue they're both deceived they say and they don't do they hear and they do not do and so they're deceived so on the one hand is verbal profession on the other is an intellectual knowledge and so, if you will, it's empty ways, empty hearts that leads folk to those painful words. I never knew you. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying. There's nothing wrong with words. Paul uh, makes it very clear. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you've got to say, yes, you've got to confess. It's necessary. But confession without obedience is fake. It's a sham. Now there's confession in verse 21. They say, Lord, Lord. Verse 22, they say, Lord, Lord. And the virgins in Matthew 25, they said, Lord, Lord. And so the first time they say, Lord, scholars and commentators believe it could be their respect because the word means master or teacher, sir. It's, 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 a, it's dignity. They're showing respect. They're recognizing. They're saying, Lord, in a sense, that we respect you. The second time, Lord, Lord, may emphasize the orthodoxy of their claim. For the word Lord is the word krios. is the word translated in the Old Testament for the name of Jehovah. And so they're saying, we know you are God. We know you are Jehovah. 
We accept all that your deity involves. We accept and believe your virgin birth, your uh, miraculous life, your resurrection, your intercession. We accept, we respect. And so they are respectful, they are orthodox, they use the right terms, the right attitude. And so the fact that they say it twice indicates also their zeal and their passion and their fervency, their commitment. Then in verse 22, they say three times, in your name, in your name, in your name. And so they're not even self-centered, if you will. We've been doing it for you, they say. We've been preaching, we've been prophesying, we've been casting out demons for you. We've been doing miracles for you. And they're pretty amazing claims. It is respectful, it is orthodox, it is zealous. They proclaim and they do works that sounds good. And we say, well, these have to be good Christians. I mean, they're very respectable. Uh, they're doing things. They're showing their zeal. It sounds good. But verse 21, not everyone that says that is going to enter. Because not everybody who says that has been doing the will of the Father who is in heaven. And so the Lord will confess in verse 23, I never knew you. And those words are taken from Psalm 6, verse 8, away from me, all you who do evil. I never knew you. These people claimed to know God, but God claimed not to have known them. Of course, he does not mean he didn't know who they were. God knows everything. God knows everyone. He knew very well who they were. And so he's not talking simply about an awareness. He's not talking about a mental comprehension here. The word know, most of the time in the Bible, means intimate relationship. And so, for example, in Amos chapter 3, verse 2, uh, God knew, sorry, Amos chapter 3, verse 2, God says of Israel, you only have, you only have I known among all the nations. Now, does that mean they, the only people he knew about were Jews? No. It meant that he had an intimate relationship with them. That's why Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. Again, in the Old Testament, it says Cain knew his wife and she bore a son. Now, it doesn't mean he knew who she was or uh, he knew her name. <coughs> it means he knew her in the absolute intimate act of marriage, if you will. And you remember that when Mary was pregnant with our Lord, as he, um, as the divine seed was infused by the Spirit of God, Joseph was shocked. And the Bible says he was shocked because he had never known her. And so you see the word know embodies an intimate relationship. And Jesus says, I never had any intimate relationship with you. Oh, you were around the fringes. You were there, but I never had that intimacy relationship with you. I never knew you that way. Why? Because of verse 23. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. You do always continue to work lawlessness or evil. That is a present tense. And so, rather than doing the will of the Father, these people were evil doers. Instead of living by these righteous principles, you do always continue to do lawlessness. Instead of doing God's will, his righteous standard, you do continually work evil. And so these people were not obedient. If you profess Christ and your life does not back it up, then you are using the name of the Lord in vain. 
That's why 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control uh, perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. James, he says this in chapter 2, verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. <coughs> and so now the most common question that comes up here in this text, the question that most people ask, did they really do these things? Did they really cast out demons? Did they really do mighty works? Now, some scholars have completely written them off and said, no, they were fakes. They made it all up. They did none of it. But personally, I'm not so sure. And my reason is, is, is a strange one. Very strange, to be fair. But I'm not so sure because I have seen witch doctors cast out evil spirits. And they were not of Christ. And personally, I don't know what to do with that. Unless, of course, you know, these are things I saw from my own eyes. So I think there's three alternatives here. Number one, they did cast out demons and did works, mighty works. They did, number one, by God's power, because in God's providence, he will use the unsaved to accomplish his will. He's always done that throughout scripture. Or number two, they did by Satan's power. Or number three, they did it. They faked it. In Matthew 24, verse 24, we are told that false Christ, false prophets will come and do signs and wonders. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, that the Antichrist is going to come and do false signs and wonders. And so Satan can do some amazing things. And then there's the whole area of just plain fakery. Yes, there could be an absolute fake. And some believe that's what was happening here. And so, as I close, again, let me just say this. We are not talking about being perfect. Yes, we know that we are going to fail. But that's where we come for forgiveness. And that's part of the righteous act. The righteous standard Jesus speaks of assumes we will fail. But when we fail, we will be there confessing. That's why 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we are the ones continually confessing our sins, we give evidence of the ones that are being forgiven. In other words, the ones being forgiven are the ones confessing. You see, he, he's, he's not saying here's the perfect standard. If you ever fail, you are out. No, he's saying here's the perfect standard. And part of the perfect standard is that when you fail, you deal with it. You come on your knees repenting and asking for forgiveness. And, and in being forgiven, that's where we get our assurance. And so 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
And so as we examine ourselves, whether to see if we are in the faith, if anything comes up from that examination, if anything that comes up, if, if God shows us that there's things in us that are not ought to be there, then we come, we take it to the cross, and we repent. If it's a true and genuine examination, I believe the Holy Spirit will always confirm and show you what you must do. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the gift of salvation. May you help us to be honest in our self-examination and to truly seek after you. Help us to be obedient to your word and to be doers of your will. For our heart's desires that you, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so Lord, I pray this morning that you will change us and cause us to be a people who hunger and thirst after your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.